I'm the only one from North America here? All right, well, you know, it's been uh, a tough couple of years, of course, for all of us. This is my first trip uh, overseas since the pandemic started. I'm sure for many of you, it's our first big meeting. So it's such a thrill to be here uh, this weekend um, and to spend time together. I know the numbers, of course, aren't as much as we're, we're used to doing, but the uh, numbers aren't what's important. It's, of course, the quality of being together and sharing knowledge and sharing information. So it's really wonderful to be here together. And we're going to get the program started. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been working with VSY for the last uh, many months. Uh, very fascinated with the technology. Wasn't fully aware of what the technology can do and how it works. But as I learned and used and got more experience with, uh, you know, the optics and the design and the attention to detail, very excited to share with you the concept. And I will be starting talking about the golden ratio, uh, which is something that uh, maybe many of you have seen in art and in the world as well today. And with us here we have Dr. Hakan Kaimak uh, from Germany, from Dusseldorf, and his partner Dr. Karsten Klabe. I just heard, actually, if you translate their names, it's cream and cookies. So those of you like cookies and cream, you're in for a treat. I'm not sure what, what Ahmed, uh, you know, translates to. I don't know, but... <laughs> as long as you don't call me Cookie Monster. I'm okay, you won't call me Cookie Monster. So if we can get, if we can get uh, my first slides up, and we thank again VSY for, uh, for putting this together. I'm not sure who can put my slides up. Here we go. This is the technical side of it. So I'm doing an introductory talk. And my talk is to speak about the new Trinova Pro and the technology behind it. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of sinusoidal diffraction, uh, but I'm going to share some thoughts around this, and I'm not sure how familiar you all are with the golden ratio. Now, these are my disclosures. I apologize. I, I do have a bit of a tendency to uh, make many friends in the business, but this allows us to really continue and to innovate together. Now, we all know we're here at ESTRS. We know, even since before, since before the pandemic, but certainly during the pandemic, how the visual needs of our cells and our patients have evolved. I mean, we're in a digital world. We're typically working intermediate and near at great lengths, whether it's computers or tablets or cell phones. And even those maybe we don't think are, for example, our grandparents and elderly, are all in the, into this era here. Now, this makes it complicated. There's always a balance in picking the right presbyopic correcting lens and meeting patient expectations. It seems like we're always trying to balance out the increased range of vision, but what happens when we manipulate light, potentially we have some risks, and those risks include contrast sensitivity loss and halos and glare. And for this, these two reasons alone, many of us have been reluctant to really offer these technologies for a wide range of patients. Well, of course, we're all looking for that masterpiece. We're looking for that perfect arrangement of technology to really address and balance these needs. And I think we have some better answers today, and I'm going to share with you. This is probably, probably best summed up in what's termed the golden ratio. And we're going to call this the golden ratio in Iowa technology. How many have heard of the golden ratio? Put up your hand. Okay, a few of you have. Well, of course, if you're inspired by the paintings of da Vinci and Dali, if you've seen what the uh, ancient Romans have done and the ancient Greeks actually were the first to identify, the beautiful asymmetry that occurs in nature with plants, with trees, with insects, with snails, and translated that into art, into architecture. And really the golden ratio is really a ratio of proportions. It's a bit more complicated than that. It's a mathematical uh, equation, the Fibonacci sequence of, uh, of numbers. We won't go, don't worry, we're not gonna go into a math lesson here. But the ability to capture that beautiful natural asymmetry, uh, which is what really is captured in these pictures, is what this is about. So for my, for my section here, I'm going to speak about masterpieces. Okay, the three masterpieces I want to share with you today. The first one is the Great Wave of Kanagawa from Hokusai. This is one of the most popular and well-known Japanese arts of the Great Wave. Mount Fuji is in the background. Now, what is it about waves? Well, in ophthalmology and optics, we always talk about waves, right? Talk about wave and particle theory of light. Well, of course, in multifocal technologies and other technologies, we use diffractive gratings and opticals to bend waves, to bend light. And the concept is waves. And you see, of course, see diffractive gratings on different lenses. But every diffractive grating is not the same. And perhaps that's something we were all taught, but they're not the same. The idea is, can we create a better diffractive design, a better surface? And this is the sinusoidal diffraction technology. Let me start on the left here. Here you see the classical blazed or sawtooth diffractive pattern. Notice the sharp edges. 
This, of course, does create bifocality. It also creates zero first and second order wavefronts. And these potentially can also cause scattered light and dysphotopsia and loss of contrast and transmission. Remember that point. It's very different with the gentle sinusoidal diffractive pattern you can see here with the minus one zero and the first order uh, wavefronts here. A very different type of modulation that you'll see how the Trinova Pro does this. And I think it's very fascinating when you think about it. I didn't realize the different ways to consider diffractive gradients. Here's an example of a traditional trifocal. You can see the sharp edges here lined up on the, on the surface of the lens. And if you look at the difference on, in, if you look at the difference in the sinusoidal gradient, can I get the next slide, please? I think I'm stuck on there. Um, here we go. Oh, back one slide. If you, if, you look, if you look at the previous slide here, you can see that the diffractive gradient is very different. The smooth surfaces are identified on the surface of the optic here, you can see. And this is different than the sharp edges. The problem with these sharp edges and the typical uh, blaze or sawtooth is we have some loss of light with the second order wavefront. What does this do? It means there's less lens trans light transmission that occurs in this lens and dysphotopsia. Two issues that make us concerned about multifocality. Next slide. Okay. So here's an example, a more focused example on traditional sawtooth diffractive multifocal. You notice the six rings here. This does provide a broad range of vision. We know that. But we lose some light. We're down to about 88% maximum light transmission. That's all we can get from the lens. And this can create glare and halos, of course, and contrast loss. On the other hand, what we're going to show with the sinusoidal pattern, which I think is brilliant, we have less loss of light. It's actually 93% transmission, which is close to the natural human lens. This reduces the issues around halos and glare. It improves contrast sensitivity. Again, the two areas we're trying to address. So go and learn about sinusoidal diffraction. This is all around us in nature. We all know, of course, the sine wave. We see it around us. It's not raining today. But if it was raining and you looked out into the canal, one of your boat cruises, you probably noticed sinusoidal diffractive waves are all around us. Let's look at the specific profile of the ridge of the sinusoidal wavefront. What you will see is that the different parts of the ridge contribute to the different focus distances. You see here on the outer part of the ridge is the near focus. On the inner part of the ridge is the far focus, and the whole surface contributes to the intermediate. We can tune this to amount, the amount of energy delivered for each of these foci point, which I think is very, very clever. We all know on the left, the regular sinus, normal sinus wave. This is basically an equal proportion, as you see there, one third toward, for example, far, one third intermediate, one third in near. But the secret sauce in what the Trinova has done is optimizing the amount given to each proportion. This is an example, for example, far can be 0.44, 44%. 20% intermediate, 30% near. And this optimization that really harnesses the ability for continuous vision and reducing side effects. And I know that uh, my colleagues will speak more about the basic data and also the clinical results as well. This is just a confocal 3D microscopic view of the surface of the lens. You can see the nice gentle sloping. There are no steps here. There are no steps that we typically see with traditional lenses. It's nicely shown in this example as well. Well, we all want to know how this lens performs clinically. This is a theoretical bench testing. This is a defocus curve. We always look at defocus curves when we think about the performance of a presbyopic lens. What we want to see is a flat top. We want to see basically continuous range of vision, 2025 or better, which is what we're seeing here, at far, intermediate, and near. And you can see again that despite the fact that we are moving light around, we retain a high degree of focus as seen in this example here. So mathematical patterns, whether it's the great wave or whether they're wave fronts on a diffractive lens, really set the stage for a masterpiece. And when you look closely, you can see the golden ratio in their masterpiece from Hokusai. Well, let me talk about the second masterpiece, and this is the Mona Lisa. We're all familiar with the Mona Lisa, of course. And da Vinci was brilliant, right? This was one of the first uh, portraits that were done with a sitting individual with a background that was imaginary, using aerial visualization, using light, to show a sundown here with, with Mona Lisa looking toward a sundown. You can see the, the image from the, in the background here. And really the use of light and colorization was brilliant in this time and remains one of the most important masterpieces of all time of art. Well, speaking of light, we know how important it is for the performance of a lens. Here's some examples of other type of multifocal lenses which do fairly well, but we all aspire to lose as much light, as minimal light as possible. You can see on the left, you see what we typically see in natural crystalline lens. 
And the trinova here is, again, very close to that. But it's more than that as well. It's also how does this perform in mesopic and scotopic conditions? Pupil adaptedness, I think, is very clever. A small pupil, we have a really good depth of focus. We may not need to really have as much light distributed, for example, to the, into the intermediate zone. On the other hand, when we have larger pupil, less accommodated demand, and night vision, we may want to shift light more toward the intermediate foci. And as you see here, we have excellent distribution to distance throughout all different pupil sizes. And the dotted line is near. You see an increase near as you get in the three to four millimeter pupil, and then it drops down in scotopic conditions while intermediate goes up. This is a very clever way to allow us to distribute light energy, again, with these focus points. Again, light and the golden ratio really contributes toward this masterpiece. A lot of it is mathematics. And as you can guess, the third masterpiece that I've just shown you here is the Trinova Pro, which is a brand new, brand new lens and a new, new platform, which is just being released here, and the Toric lens will be out soon, and I'm very excited to hear about the clinical results that my colleagues will be sharing. So we've really spoken about the golden ratio, the beauty of the natural asymmetry out there, whether it's plants, leaves, trees, snails, architecture, art, or intraocular lenses. And the golden ratio really is about achieving continuous range of vision across a broad range of focus distances from far intermediate to near, optimizing light transmission, reducing issues around contrast sensitivity, improving that mesopic you know, vision and scotopic vision, and importantly, minimizing halos and glare. You know, we're gonna hear a lot more about the basic science work and the clinical work, and it's my pleasure to introduce here uh, Dr. Kai Mack from Dusseldorf. Please come up to the stage and, and take us through some of your basic science work and optical work. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much for the possibility to talk about our optical bench results. And as you know, the vision with multiple uh, intraocular lenses are always a simultaneous vision for the distance, the intermediate, and the near vision. And you have the total image on the focal plane of the retina, which has a little bit less contrast. But what we also know is that we have the contrast adaptation in the eye, so that we have an increase in of contrast after some weeks, so we have a perfect vision with the multifocal IOLs. I think it's interestingly that we see those contrast adaptation also in eyes with macular disorders, and I think it's important for you two guys that also the glaucoma patients have this contrast senti uh, sensitivity uh, adaptation profile. So what we need is before implantation of multifocal IOLs, I think we should know which material we have, what about the spectacle independence, what about the optical performance, what about the light transmission, and what about dysphotopsia. Material is very easy. I don't know if you ever know which material you are using when you're implanting the intraocular lenses, but for the Trinova Pro, we know it's the Abbe number, 80, uh, 58 and the refractive index, uh, index of 1.46. And if you look for this magic line, it's really clear. And this is what you find in the literature, and these are the results with the Trinova Pro. That means we have a perfect uh, material in, with this lens. Looking now for the spectacle independence. We have this setup published two years ago in the University of Homburg, where we do these light field measurements. And what you see here is that you have perfect focal points for the distance, for the intermediate, and for the near. If we try this at home, you can also do it with here, Uso, and I think we try it with Raki, and it also uh, fits perfect with this laser beam and this uh, lighting conditions. Here you see the light field measurements and the axial brightness of this lens. It's perfect. You have these uh, small curves, and you have also look for the lateral brightness. And this is also perfect for multifocal IOLs. The next thing is what we have to know is that the styles growth effect also help us or the patients to see better with this multifocal uh, intraocular lenses. This was some years ago, Applegate showed this in his patients. 
What about spectacle independence? We don't have to forget the pupil independence. What we do see here, we see here the, the focus curves and with three different uh, conclusions. What you see here is that the, the focus curve of a bifocal IOL and you have different uh, curve lines and this is, depends on the pupil size. This is the curve with a large pupil, this is with a medium pupil and this is with a small pupil. That means we have an effect of pupil size on the focus curve. And when you are promising your patient's spectacle independence, it should be also be independent of the pupil size. And this is all about with the Trinova Pro. You have a pupil adaptive design. That means you have a balanced resolution with this different pupil measurements. That means for small pupils and also for large pupils. We have done our measurements with the US Air Force charts under different lighting conditions and with different uh, pupil sizes. And what we found is that we have this balanced pupil energy level even in dim light conditions. So what you see here is the profile of the light distribution for large pupil and also for the small pupil. And this is really perfect balance in the eyes for the patients. You can see it again, the trifocal profile, it's a little bit less with the small pupil. That means you can save energy because you have a, a little bit of depth of focus um, with the small pupil. And for the larger pupil, you can see the trifocal profile. That means we checked it. We have also the spectacle independence in the laboratory. What about the optical performance? I think wavefront aberrations are very important. And so we looked and we checked it for the multifocal IOLs. And as you can see here below is that it's really perfect. You have very low values of wavefront aberrations. What about when you are checking in the eye? You know that you have a balance between the cornea and the lens. So we have different eye models, the model one, with a uh, aberration-free cornea, and the model two with a cornea with a spherical aberration of 0.28. And you see that the TriNova Pro performs very good when you compare it with the other trifocal IOLs. When we just look for the common cornea, that's, that's most what you found, it's the, with the spherical aberration of 0.28, to eight spherical aberration, then you see you have a best MTF curve with small pupils, and even it's better than the Adolf lens uh, with a wider pupil. So we have an optical excellence with this lens, and we have a very high light transmission. What about dysphotopsia? We are all afraid of dysphotopsia when we are talking about multifocal IOLs. But we don't have to forget that we have very Im uh, implanted many years spherical IOLs and they have also halos and glare with those lenses and we have no fear about this. And when you look for fake patients, these are our employees and we check out for halos and glares, you see they don't have perfect vision, they don't have perfect visual quality. In the mean, they have also have halos and glare. This is something normal, we have to say. So now, what about the patients with the multifocal IOLs, when we look for the halos? This is the theoretical background. We know that we have halos with multifocal IOLs, and we have greater halos when we have higher uh, near additions. But we don't or we have to think about this because when you have this greater halo, the intensity is very important. This is not balanced here with the near addition. That means um, halos, you can balance them. It's more the intensity what is really important, not the size, it's the intensity. And we can play with this, and this was done with the Trinova Pro. As you can see here, this is the halo and glare measurements, and you see there is no intensity for the halos with the small pupil and also with the greater pupil. 
So looking now for the hair uh, and clearless, and when we uh, compare it with our employees and we put it here, you see there's not a big difference with the normal Halo and Claire, and when we check it up here with the Trinova Pro. So the conclusion is very clear. We have the best material, what is available. We have the spectacle independence with pupil independence. We have an optical excellence. We have a very high light transmission. And also we have Halo and Claire similar to Adolf lenses. So we were ready to implant the multifocal IOLs and I can handle it to Carsten. He has done the surgeries in our clinic first. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Hakan. Thank you, Ike. And thank you to VSI for the uh, kind invitation to be able to show our first early results with the Trinova Pro and uh, I'm very proud because I'm first time in my life I'm faster than Ike. It's nearly impossible, you know. It would be the last time, but we were able to implant the Trinova starting five to six weeks ago, means our results are really uh, up to date. We don't have a long-term outcome, uh, but uh, there is a tendency. So I will present you my very first case, a female patient, age 75, um, visual acuity 2040, 2030, with a mild hyperopia and a uh, little astigmatism, normal pressure, mild cataract, and no other pathologies. She loves reading, cooking, walking, so what we expect from a perfect grandma. So, and uh, sh she wishes to be spectacle free. So, uh, first of all, have a look on the biometry, and uh, so the, the Zeiss um, IOL master offers a central OCT as well, as you see on the right side. You see the uh, uh, opification of the lens, and um, marked in red here, there is an astigmatism. So, I would prefer to, to treat with a toric lens, but uh, at the moment, there is no toric uh, model of the Trinova on the market, so uh, we decided to uh, correct the astigmatism with the in incision size and location. So here we go, um, first surgery on the left eye. Remember the eye was not so high astigmatism. Uh, the patient wishes a standard procedure, so we uh, uh, don't use the femtolaser assisted cataract surgery, which I would prefer, especially in these uh, type of lenses, because of the better possible, better centration, preventing of tilt, and so on. So it's not a really rock hard cataract. Uh, able to, mention, to manage it easily. And then after polishing the uh, capsule, I love to first implant the capsule attention ring. Uh, to hold the capsule back open and to prevent a shrinking after surgery. Here we go, some whisk elastic. Capsule attention ring first. And here we go, the new Trinova Pro, a modified C, -hapt C loop haptic. Uh, and uh, in this case, we used our standard shooter system, the Medicel uh, shooter. The incision size is 2.2 millimeters, and the injector fits well with all of these models, and as well with the Trinova Pro. It was a lens of about 24 diopters. So you see I'm doing it the first time, that is why it took a little longer. So the, the feeling of the, of the lens is a little bit more than hydrophobic, than hydrophilic, and you see it, it pops up like a hydrophilic, but it, it's a little bit stiffer in implantation than a hydrophobic intraocular lens, but it immediately centrates 
after opening the, the C-loop haptics. And there is only one step to go, removing viscoelastic, and that's fine. So you see, uh, again, the immediate centration of the lens. So, okay. Don't, don't want to bore you with the next curve, as a case again. Can we go on? Okay, once again. So, uh, have a, a little bit. So we have heard a lot of the the optic design and the speciality. So now only some some basic surgical designs. The optic diameter is six millimeter. The overall diameter is thirteen. We have a C loop. Uh, haptic with zero degrees of angulation, which I like. We have a 360 degrees so sharp edge optic design to prevent uh, PCO. Uh, Harkon uh, gave off all the details about the, the uh, special optic uh, numbers, ABI number, refractive index. The um, A concern is 180.0, and the lens will be available in from zero to 32 diopters in uh, half diopter uh, steps. Okay, now we are back again. As, as a second eye, yes, a same surgeon, second eye. Can we go forward? Here you see uh, a picture or two pictures of the centration of the intraocular lens week one and month one after surgery. Perfect centration, really surprised about this. And that is the visual acuity, 0.8 or LOGMA 0.1 and zero LOGMA at one month post-op. So, but um, I pointed it out very well that we are looking in these patients underwent more or less refractive surgery for the best uncorrected visual acuity achievable. And so uh, point eight, far view uh, on both eyes and um, point six to point eight in intermediate and newer visual acuity. So um, I think you're really satisfying result in our first patient. Um, the second thing we have to check is the contrast sensitivity. Uh, we're using the Freiburg Visual Acuity and Contrast Test, which uh, enables us to do a contrast sensitivity testing in under photopic and mesopic conditions. We can only show you the photopic because it doesn't make any sense before three months are gone to do the mesopic testing. Uh, but here, the photopic testing uh, fits into the normal range and on the left side the, the, the focus curve which is nearly the same as we see in the uh, theoretical derived defocus curve. And here our first patient, even reading in bed before I'm going to sleep is not a problem anymore and uh, very important, uh, I can read number plates earlier than my, my husband and he is a driver. So, and uh, you can imagine driving in Germany is a little bit different. We are talking about uh, driving in Germany with Ike. So the German Autobahn, uh, it's a little different to, to, to Canada as well. Uh, so happy patient makes a happy surgeon. And for your first lens, um, if you have a look, uh, you earn these uh, uh, wonderful hat as well, as a gift. So uh, now we have a look on our first 20, um, Patients underwent the surgery with the Trinova Pro, and uh, as you see, monocular visual acuity is, is really surprisingly good. And what we know, and that was mentioned before, uh, the cataract surgery with a trifocal, especially trifocal lenses, needs a, a binocular summation to improve the performance of these lenses, and we see binocular nearly uh, 100% visual acuity in distance, in uh, intermediate, and in, in near visual acuity, uncorrected, and that is surprisingly good. Um, of course, it depends on the patient selection, but uh, we were really, really surprised about these brilliant results. 
uh, we've seen the slide already. That is a theoretically derived the focus curve. But if you compared it to the now on the 20% uh, 20 uh, patients uh, measured the focus curve, it's nearly the same. It's it's uh, it fits very very well, and we have good results, excellent results in visual acuity in all distances. And um, Next, HALO and GLARE results from the questionnaire. You see 30% of our patients perceived HALOs. 73 patients perceived GLARE. So yeah, we expect this. But nobody of our patients was suffered by the intensity of these optical phen phenomena. So uh, they all ranged these lens good to very good. And so, and then we compared it to the halo and glare simulator, and as a control group, we choose our own stuff in the office. And as you see, the mean age, they are half as old as me, 26.8. And on above the, the, the simulation pictures, you see the intensity uh, of halo and glare and the size young, healthy people see. And I was really surprised by the excellent performance uh, at the, uh, of the Trinova Pro Group. So, of course, it's a limited amount, the first 20 patients. So, uh, but no patient was uh, suffered by severe halo and glare. There is mild halo and glare, but it's always acceptable. They are not disturbed by this. So, in my opinion, excellent real-time, uh, real-world uh, data, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, both Dr. Kaimak and Dr. Klabe, for uh, sharing some optical bench work as well as some of your clinical work. And I realize that there's uh, certainly opportunity for questions. So we do want to have some time for questions, um, unlike other sessions, we're actually running a little bit ahead, so I congratulate the speakers for being on time. Um, but I don't know if you have any, any comments to make before we get into questions, Dr. Kaimak. Anything you want to add to Dr. Klabe's presentation? Well, I think um, we have to thank uh, the company for trusting in us because they just let us go. And we are implanting, we are testing the lenses, we are just presenting them. It's real, real life data, and thank you for that, for your trust. Well, it all starts with the science, so I think that's, that's what's important. Okay, so um, we have uh, a number of questions that have come in online, uh, and we have an opportunity for anyone in the audience too. So far, the online people are winning. I don't see any questions from here yet. Who's gonna ask a question in the audience first? Because we'd really love to get some live interaction, but there's some online questions already. Anybody from the audience? I know somebody wants to speak. I know you wanna speak in the front here, my Spanish friends, right? I know that. Okay, well, let's, for, let's first get into some questions that are from online, okay? And you guys can think about it a little bit, but I'm gonna be disappointed if there's no questions from here. I'll come out and, and get some people here. Okay, well, um, I, I mean, this, this is obviously, um, you know, a different type of technology than what we've seen with other multifocals. And there's a number of questions that have come up about any of your experiences or data comparing, um, you know, the Trinova versus other multifocal lenses. Uh, there are a lot of multifocals out there, right? So many choices out there. Um, any, any, any data you're aware of or any personal comparison you can make just with uh, other types of multifocals, whether they're specific or general? Anybody? Maybe I'll ask, uh, maybe you first have to comment and then Dr. can think about it. Well, I think jacket. the first question is um, when your patient really wants spectacle independence, then we have to use the trifocal IOLs. I think that's clear. It's not possible to have spectacle independence with other lenses, with Adolf lenses, or something like that. It's really just possible with trifocal uh, intraocular lenses, and I think that's the reason why it's not out. What do you think about this? So, yeah, yeah, in my opinion, you're absolutely right. So, uh, we were talking over the last years about these uh, blended vision concepts with, with EDOF lenses, uh, but I was still a fan of trifocal lenses, so, uh, and, and that's why I'm, I'm relatively sure, so, so I'm, I'm sure that I will, uh, as, as far as it's commercial available, I will adapt the Trinova Pro into the spectrum to treat uh, patients, especially 
patient with, uh, which looking for, for being spectacle free, yeah. Great, yeah, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I'm curious what you think. I mean, many people, I'm sure, in the audience as well ha have kind of shied away a little bit from multifocal lenses, and you see now the emergence of more EDOF designs in the last uh, five years, I would say. Uh, we see monofocals uh, coming out as well. So um, well, what are your thoughts about, you know, really uh, re-looking re re at multifocal designs? Can these designs bring maybe people back towards multifocals when the concern was because of halos and glare. Uh, in contrast, uh, understandably, that's why people go to EDOFs, right? That's one, one reason why. Yeah. Um, do you feel these, these uh, changes, these innovations in these, this type of lens may bring us back towards shifting back a little bit back toward multifocals for those patients that maybe we were concerned about? I think so. So we were talking 10 years ago about the optical quality of, of intraocular lenses. So introduced the spheric lenses, improved the, the optical uh, um, uh, quality of the lenses and uh, with the introduction of EDOF lenses so we lower optical uh, quality at the end of the day so and, and I think the, to, uh, the way to improve our trifocal design that is uh, the, 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 the better way to treat presbyopia. Yeah. And what uh, didn't change is, is that you have to talk with your patients. You have to know what they want and you have to choose the right patients. And then you have a really a great multifocal IOL when you can implant it that the patient get spectacle independent. I think that's the key message. And for patients where I'm planting as new standard the Adolf lenses, Yes, this is possible. If you just want to do a fast job, then it's okay. But if you spend time with your patients, when you are talking about the lenses, when you're explaining the patients, then I think that's really the great choice and the opportunity for the patients and for the doctor. Yeah, I, I mean, I think with light transmission that we're seeing, like 93%, I mean, I think that addresses some of our concerns with contrast. I mean, we, hate, we don't like when patients come back and say, I can't see as well, it's waxy vision, ghosting. I think that does help, and I think you see this, and the basic optical work really supports that. Um, and, and I think that because of the lack of these, you know, higher order wave fronts that end up causing dysphotopsias, you know, the, the wave fronts are used all for intermediate, far, and near, rather than having lost light, which causes, you know, glare and halos. I hate to be too mathematical and optical, but, you know, we, we, are, we are physicians, we're scientists, we have to understand the optics of what we put in people's eyes. This is gonna be in people's eyes for the rest of their life, it would be foolish and I think not appropriate to not understand the optics. And I know people around me believe in that. So I think those are reasons why I think, and there's nothing that beats uh, full spectacle freedom. I mean, that's the holy grail we're all looking for. And of course, it's about risk and benefit. I know there was a question here. I think Mohammed's gonna come up and use the mic. So thank you for doing that. You should get a prize. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're giving some prizes later. Yes, we got a round of applause for the, for the, from the audience. Okay. Who, and I hope there's gonna be somebody else, okay? Really, I'm gonna come after you guys if you don't ask questions here, because now's your chance. <laughs> they get a photograph of you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the nice discussion, but I, I want to ask you your experience regarding mix and match. Is it possible that we can do one extended depth of focus in one eye and one trifocal in the other eye, or is this very confusing for the patient? So. Great question, and we get asked a, asked a lot. So because it's a very easy question, I'm gonna ask you know, Dr. Klaube to answer first. That, because it's an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. But it's not an easy answer for me. So now, if we have a trifocal lens which performs so well, so I always would prefer to implant a trifocal. So I'm not a, uh, a great fan of, of, so if we have a, an equal optic design, probably the, the EDOF is in diffractive bifocal lens as well we can expect the same optical quality. So it, it, it could be a solution. But I've often seen in this patient that they are, have a, a, a lack in, in, in reading at night. So probably because your, your uh, EDOF addresses far in the intermediate vision and they have a, a, a loss in, in near view vision and, and that's why. So and, and, uh, if you have seen here with the excellent light transmission um, I think both eyes trifocal, uh, that it's much better for, for spectacle independence in all distances. 
and you have also this binocular sum uh, summation, I think that's really something important to know. You have an improvement in the visual quality when you put it, this lens in both eyes. If you ask, is this a mistake when you uh, took one multifocal IOL and the other the monofocal, then the, uh, question, uh, the, the answer is clear, no. The brain, the brain is really open. Uh, it's an open mind for all these things, so it's no problem for the adaptation. Yeah, I, I, I know many people have success with mixing and matching, so I cannot poo-poo it too much, because some people really like that, and they do it because they want to have maximum contrast and distance and, and a dominant eye, and maybe do a tropical nether eye. I get that. We used to do that, for example, when we had bifocals, bifocal uh, multifocal lenses, where we would do a, a closer add in one eye and a, and a low power add in the other eye to get a range of vision. We do that because of compromises with lenses. And if the lens technology has the right light transmission, addresses dysphotopsy and has excellent distance vision, then maybe we don't need to do those compromises. And I think that's what uh, perhaps, this, this perhaps this can do. I do like having binocular summation. I think you've shown it here. Um, I prefer to do uh, both eyes at the same if I can. Patients will always say, you know, this eye feels drier a little bit. I have ptosis. It's because you put this lens in and not in the other eye, you know. Whatever the reasons are, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think it's just generally a good idea with both eyes. People like to have both eyes kind of similar in that way in, in my experience. Okay, so great question from the floor. I see that uh, you guys are all thinking about more. Oh, we have another question from Bilbao. Fantastic. I heard the food is very good in Bilbao, yeah. right? Okay, and the people are okay, apparently. But, okay. but she got the photo already. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I have two questions. The first is, uh, what formula do, do, do you use regularly? I also like uh, Barrett, Universal 2. And what, which is your goal? Is lightly myopic, hyperopic, or emetropic? And the second question is, about uh, the management of the lens in the theater. Uh, we have used this kind of lens before, and we have some troubles using the injector. So you, do you use the injector that they provide you, or do you use an alternative? Okay, well, injector? first of all, we only allow one question per questioner, so oh. we can't take all your questions. I'm sorry, well, I'm the... Just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking, okay, let's, get, let's go through this. Great questions, thank you. Absolutely, great questions. So first question is on the, your preferred formula for, for this platform. Yeah, Barrett. Mm -hmm. yeah. Barrett, okay, Barrett Universal, Universal 2. This uh, symposium is partly sponsored by Graham Barrett. Um, <laughs> I'm just joking, but Barrett Universal 2, and I, and I like that too. I think that's kind yeah. of been our go-to for now. I, I think the cane, the cane has some promise as well, so, but I've been using Barrett for the most part. Okay, second question, what do you aim? I know many people with monofocals, they'll typically aim a bit myopic, you know. Uh, what is your per preference that, for how you aim, target this lens? That doesn't make any sense. Mm. Slight hyperopia, quarter of a diopter, it's, it, uh, the patient is really happy. So if you have implanted a multifocal or trifocal, and the, the patient is still slightly myopic, uh, no, it doesn't work. They, you don't have a, a happy patient because mm -hmm. the expectation is a brilliant far view vision, which I can understand. The, the aim is emetropia, but if you want to be on the safe side, you go a little bit in the hyperopic uh, the focus. But emetropia, that's the best. Yeah, and I think that's important. It's also gotta, we have to be confident with our formulas as well. And I totally agree. If you look at that defocus curve, if that patient ends up myopic, you know, you, they have less focus reserve to use, and you're going to compromise the distance vision. So if you end up even being a little bit hyperopic, they typically will be able to use some of that defocus to help. A and that's what we want. We want to be able to get that maximum distance focus. So that, I agree with that. You know, that's true for most presbyopic lenses, and that's a very good question. Okay, the third one was what injector are you using? Uh, is it different? Are you having any, you know, challenge? Or what, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? So I, I still stay on the conventional Medicel shooter system, as you've seen in the video. So I tried a couple of different things, and uh, so I feel fine with this. Uh, it fits to, to two millimeters, and my incision size is 2.2, so it's, it's excellent. And uh, okay, if you use the former version, it was a little bit more like a plate haptic. Uh, so um, the, the first lenses I put in the shooter, otherwise my nurse will do this during the procedure, so I'm not in trouble with this. Uh, but the delivery of the lens um, 
independently from the plate haptic or the sealoop haptic. It's really easy. It snaps a little bit more throb than a uh, and, and, uh, typical <coughs> hydrophobic lens, as you've seen, but it's, it's fine. If you want to watch, we can watch the Dr. Klaber's video for the fifth time. For the fifth time, <laughs> yeah. You have to watch it again, but really, I, th I think we're, I'm just, I'm just joking, <laughs> I was joking, actually. So did I. No, no, I was, I was kidding, we saw it enough, man. Really? Nice jacket, by the way. Do you like his jacket? Yeah, I thought it was a very nice jacket. Yeah, very, yeah. That's why he stood up for that. Okay. Speaking of that question. The sneakers qu you didn't mention. <laughs> the sneakers are very good. We won't, you can't see that. They're very, they're very white. Um, so, a well, question from online. Thank you, online peeps. That's good for asking questions because in the room is getting warmed up. Um, what about the differences from the previous trifocal model? I mean, that's a very good question. And I can maybe speak to that a little bit. So there's a couple of things that are different. First of all, you can see the actual uh, haptic design. It's gone from a plate to a C-loop, which I think is very good. The light transmission has gotten a little bit better. It was already good, 92%, it's 93%. The ads have changed a bit. So you can see the near ad on the new is 3.6, intermediate is 1.8, it was a little bit less on the previous, mo on the previous model as well. Um, and so also the pupil adaptiveness has changed. Before basically, we didn't, we kind of, you kind of had the same amounts at uh, different pupil sizes, uh, but now we see this change from intermediate to near depending on pupil size. So that's the pupil adapted nature of it. So those are some of the differences. There probably might be some other things as well, but uh, I think those are some exciting differences that, uh, that exist between the two. I should also add that I'm aware a new injector is coming through. So I think that'll be something that we all look forward toward. Injectors are not the first thing we think about, but obviously when you're in the OR, you want something to go smooth. Yeah. And so it's nice to have that. Um, Questions come up about incision size. Maybe you mentioned it, uh, Karsten. What okay. incision size are you using? Standard 2.2. Okay, um, good. Uh, online, there are more questions. So are you, are, are, is the group gonna speak up here or are you guys finished with your questions? Because we still have a few minutes. And interaction, I think, is fantastic. They have interaction here. Usually the speaker is taking up all the time. Well, now this is your time. So listen, the, the back row, you guys have been very quiet. We, ha we have a question oh, over question. there. Okay, we, got, we, we have can. a backup question here. But I'm looking from the back row here. People in the back half of the auditorium. We're going to lock the doors if we don't ask a question, so think <laughs> about it. Go ahead, my friend. Okay, question here. Does, does a plate haptic give you more centration than the C-loop haptic? So what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think, Dr. Kaimak? What do you think? Question. Normally, yes, but in this case, no. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, surprisingly. Uh, yeah, in... in, in uh, the design of a plate haptic, so uh, implements an immediate centration of the lens and the C loop, it took a, a, a couple, I was surprised about the perfect centration at day one. So mm -hmm. probably with the support of the capsule attention ring. So, but uh, the, the, the material of the lens is, is stiff enough mm -hmm. uh, and the, the haptics are equal elastic on both sides that there is an excellent centration. I think it, it, it's not an, an issue anymore. Um, and um, for implantation, uh, or if you have a larger capsular bag, so I see a higher risk. <coughs> yeah. Uh, so with, with other platforms uh, and other types of lenses, I, I use uh, um, plate haptics in any range. So, um, uh, but, but mostly, you are right, mostly monofocal lenses where decentration doesn't uh, um, plays such an important role. Um, and in a really high myopic eyes, um, less than 10 diopters lens size, there is, in my opinion, a theoretical higher risk of, de uh, of slightly decentration with a plate haptic. And, uh, so design is good. We, we all know C-loop haptics as well, and I trust them. It works well. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's some there's a number of studies out there. Uh, you know, in my personal opinion, I I I believe C-loop haptics are more stable, rotationally stable, but also uh, axially more stable as well. I mean, you know, the if you think about the the tension forces, the centripetal forces on the on the capsular bag with contracture, a plate haptic could flex more rather than a C-loop haptic, which will which are compressed inside. So I, I do think that's, that's a benefit. Um, and, and I think you see a lot of manufacturers going there. That's my own bias, my own personal feeling, and I think there's some data to support that as well. Um, okay, so uh, we, we do have a few more questions left. I do want to make sure we spend a little bit of time uh, for the last part, because I know you're all here to see, hear about the 
big prizes that are coming out, okay? So we're, there's gonna be some prizes, so you wanna stick around to see who wins those prizes, so that's important. Okay, a couple more, a couple questions here. Uh, speaking of centration, uh, this is from online again. Where, how do you center the lens? What do you base the centration of the lens on when you're operating or on preoperative biometry? Any, any, any comments? Well, I think when the lens is in the capsular back, then the lens fits itself, so you can't <laughs> do anything. I, I believe we can, I mean, I kind of, I kind of nudge the lens. I think you're maybe right. It kind of made me want to, want to go where it wants to go. But I do feel good about using the microscope, you know, coaxial light from the microscope, uh, preferably stereo coaxial. I, and that's kind of the line of sight. Patients fixate on it. And we all want to try to center this lens on the, on the, on the, on the, line, of, on the line of sight. So that's kind of what I typically try to do. Um, you know, I think that we all, we all know, of course, the pupil centration compared to the uh, geometric centration of the, of the cornea and the light of sight in between there, so that's kind of what I typically do. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you did that in your case, Karsten, you had purpose centration so afterwards, but I try yeah. at least doing that. <laughs> yeah, w w would you add myotics at the end of surgery, routinously in this kind of lenses? I, I don't add myotics, no. Okay. no Only no. reflex and coaxial yeah. illumination. Correct, so I lined up so with the yeah. first, first Purkinje image off the cornea, <coughs> lined up with the uh, coaxial light of the microscope, at, at patient fixated assisted, and I use that kind of, I'm looking at the camera right there, that's exactly what I look at. Okay. Yeah. Nicholas so there, so try. Yeah, great. But there's a little bit of bias because the, the pupil centration differs between preoperative and postoperative, and the centration of the IOL depends on the pupil size under mesopic and photopic conditions. Well, it's a little bit theoretical. I think you win when the lens is in the capsular back, and then <laughs> you can that's go a good, on. That's a good take home line. You win when the lens is in the capsular back. Yeah, so don't break the poster capsule. That's a lesson there. Very, very, very good point. Um, uh, what about, there's some questions here, and again, anyone from the audience? Yes. Oh man, you, you, you have to get a prize, three yes, questions Yes, triple. <laughs> <laughs> question was, uh, why did you use a CTR in this case? It was a very angry question. <laughs> I know, I'm kidding. Uh, He's taking a drink first. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have to think for a while. Um, in, uh, why, the, 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 um, in, in most of my cases, especially as I told you, um, um, multifocal haptics, eat of haptics as well, um, um, I will have an immediate centration and I will have a, pr a long term prevention of actual shift. And uh, so but that is my personal opinion, I will immediately achieve a perfect refractive result and there will be no shift over the time. That's why we, we use capsule attention rings. Yes, it's not in, necessary in, in for the IOL. It's a roti, yeah. yeah. Every patient. He uses it for everybody because you can bill more. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, I, it's an interesting point. I mean, I, I do think, like, I like to use CTRs when I'm putting a toric lens and an axial length more than 27 and a half millimeters. I feel that there's, you know, better AP apposition of the, of the capsule and circularization of the bag. But I don't do it routinely, to be honest. Uh, I don't do it routinely, and I think, uh, I think our A constants are, are pretty good with that. But it's interesting, Dr. Klabe's uh, perspective to hear that. Um, and of course, if the zonules are weak, then we have to be careful for any of these lenses. Um, okay, I know we're getting down toward the end here, but there's a question about what dioptic range is available for this lens. It's a zero to 34 diopters, which mm -hmm. I think is, a, is an excellent range, which is great. Um, when will it be available? Uh, it's available basically now. So as far as I know, right, I hope, I hope I didn't lie. After uh, this session. After the session, <laughs> yeah, there's some lenses out in the back. And uh, also uh, the cost. So if you ask a question, you're gonna get a discount. But uh, the cost, actually, I don't know. The, co the cost will depend on your country. So I would maybe suggest speaking to the, to the company, which is, um, which, which is at the booth as well. So I think we basically have gone through uh, a lot of questions. I know there's still some questions online. Thank you all for listening online. Hang on, we're not done yet. And thank you all for being in the room. I'm going to move over to the podium because I have some awards to give. So thank you. Do we have some music? No? Okay, so, uh, you know, VSY has been great in supporting uh, research. Uh, for three years, they've had these ophthalmology uh, star awards, uh, and it's a pleasure to uh, announce the winners. They were uh, over 60 or 70 applicants that, from around the world, from many different countries. 
Oh, don't show the result yet. Um, and so, I'm just joking. So, uh, we're very pleased to do this. And in fact, the three award winners are actually myself, Dr. Kaimak, and Dr. Klabe. So, congratulations to ourselves for getting the awards. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Actually, we do have true winners here. I don't, know if I, can, I don't know if I can grab, if you can help me with the award. So, our third place award, whoop, went too fast, uh, is from India, Dr. Arvind Kumar Moria. Uh, it's a long title. I mean, I wish it wasn't so long, I have to say it all of it, evaluating the viability of a smartphone-based annotation tool for faster and accurate image labeling for artificial intelligence and diabetic retinopathy. Very futuristic, so how about, a, how about a round of applause, Dr. Moria, I couldn't make it here today, but we'll get them the award for Dr. Moria, thank you. <laughs> oh, I wanted to show them the award, but okay, I'll show the award for the ne hopefully the next, next one. Okay, second place, uh, Dr. Farhad Hafezi, who I think we all know very well, uh, I don't know if Farhad is here, but if he is, we can have him come to the, uh, come to the front. Maybe he, we can make him take the long walk. Very brilliant researcher, brilliant surgeon, colleague of ours. Of course, uh, individualized corneal cross-linking with riboflavin and UVA and ultrathin corneas, the sub-400 protocol. So Farhad, thanks for coming up. I mean, I would have you up here give a speech because you always share great knowledge, but let me give you your award, okay? And, and by, by the way, the award, the award is, uh, this is the most, most, the best part of the award. You have a beautiful uh, little trophy for you here. I don't know if you can see it on the screen there. So I'll give that to you to hold. Thank you. And this is not, this is not that important, but it's just a book oh, by, by some unknown, <laughs> uh, unknown author that's, uh, that's written that uh, we just published for you. And maybe you can share it with your, you know, you know everything already. Yep. Maybe you can share it, with your, maybe share it with your trainees. So thank you very much. Thank you. How about a picture together? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, and our, and our first place award, uh, all, all, the, all the award winners are fantastic. Dr. Magdalena Renner, and uh, the title of the research here was Cell Types of the Human Retina and Its Organoids at Single Cell Resolution. That'll be our next talk, by the way, so I want to stay for that one. Uh, but congratulations to Dr. Renner, congratulations to all the award winners. Those of you who are doing research, stay, stay tuned for uh, next year uh, to uh, submit uh, a presentation or submit a uh, research to the Ophthalmology Star Awards. Uh, that basically really kind of concludes um, our presentation. Uh, I think we'll be here for a few minutes for those of you that uh, were a little shy in asking any questions. But I really want to thank uh, you, know, you all for being here. Thank you to VSY. Thank you for the wonderful presentations. Dr. Kaimak, you know, really, a, he's a true scientist uh, trying to get down to the answers that we're looking for. And Dr. Klabe, you know, you've been a great friend. Usually I see you uh, on the streets after the meeting you know, talking about great ideas. So I love to hear your work here and being part of this presentation and you're dressing very well. I'm, I'm pretty impressed. Uh, I, I have an idea. <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you want to check out his uh, sneakers before you go if you haven't seen them. And uh, thank you for being here. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the presentations and I enjoy seeing many of you here. It's great to be back together again with the pandemic is over, uh, uh, hopefully over soon. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to retire Zoom. We're all looking forward to that. Thank you very much. Thank you.